April 2nd. April 2nd changed my life forever. Rita Mae was born at approximately 6.07 in the morning, and my wife and I brought her home for her next day. No one ever tells you how much a baby changes your life. It's, it's one of those experiences that's hard to really put down in words. I'm here to tell you it straight, all right? Um, there won't be any sugarcoating here. Being a parent is a full-time job, and a lot of times it feels like you want to pull your hair out. You know? Don't get me wrong, we immediately fell in love with Rita. For the first two weeks, as a matter of fact, you could say that she was a perfect little angel. I mean, in fact, I'd never even seen a baby act so good. My wife, Stephanie, was overjoyed with being able to breastfeed, getting Rita into a sleeping routine, even having a little time for herself since Rita was accommodating to her bassinet so well right off the bat. Those early days would make any parent immediately think about having another kid, even if they were all so amazing and all so well behaved like our newborn was. But something changed at the two-week mark. I, I wish I could say for sure it was. I had to work that day and Steph took our little girl to the doctor for her first round of vaccinations. I mean, a routine appointment that every child has to endure. We knew to expect some fussiness after the shots were given. The doctor also advised us to make sure that she was fed regularly and not dehydrated. According to them, sleepiness was a side effect of the medicine, so after the screaming died down, Rita would get drowsy and we would go back to the same old routine as before. But, um... Well, the problem is that... that never happened. On my lunch break, I called Steph to see how our little princess was doing, only to hear a loud shriek that made my eardrums want to burn. I'll, I'll, I'll call you later, I shouted as I hung up and frowned, wondering how long our newborn had been upset. I assumed it was just a simple crying spell. It would be over by the time I got home. Instead, that afternoon, as I walked in, I heard Rita squealing, and Steph was pacing the kitchen, trying to burp her. Hey, there's my little angel. How's daddy's girl? I cooed. Steph shot me a dirty look and offered the squealing infant to me. I don't know what's wrong with her. I've tried everything. Bottles, blankets, bath, you name it. I tried it, she admitted as she tried to hold back tears. I think she's clearly distressed. I mean, earlier when I tried to breastfeed, she bit me so hard that it drew blood. Rita continued to squeal as I rocked her. It looked at our baby girl in concern. Think we should go to the emergency room? Should you call the doctor? I asked. Steph nodded as she paced the refrigerator. Pediatrician has got a free opening on Thursday, but that's days away. Maybe we should go to the ER? It's been hours now, and it's non-stop. I think that lab tech did something. I, I don't know. I didn't know what to do either. We don't live close to a hospital. I knew the drive would be taxing, especially because I was supposed to go to work the next day. No one gives you an instruction manual for this sort of stuff. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and go. I mean, it's better to be safe than sorry, I told my wife. We loaded up the car and put our newborn in the rear-facing car seat, all while she continued to cry and scream, anxiety levels spiking as we drove down the road. Steph sat back there with her, trying to comfort her, but I soon saw firsthand nothing seemed to be working. My mind began to race as I wondered what could possibly be the matter. What if Steph was right and the tech had punctured a nerve, or was our daughter going to be all right? As soon as we got to the emergency room, I fully expected that Rita's wails would get us seen immediately, but reality set in when we were given paperwork to fill out and paced the waiting room alongside everyone else. We sat down and I tried my best to focus on the questionnaire, but the more Rita cried and screamed, the more irritable I became. Not with her, but, but with the hospital staff. I mean, they seemed to take no interest in her suffering, letting other clearly less urgent cases into the triage. Maybe we should try to go somewhere else. I mean, there's a small neighborhood urgent care down the road, I told Steph. But they only accept cash. We don't have that kind of money. I worried that we were bound to be at the hospital all night, so I got up and called my boss, told him I wouldn't be coming in the next morning. I mean, he wasn't happy about that, but he claimed that he understood. Family comes first. All while I was doing this, I kept hearing Rita and wondering if she was even catching her breath. I mean, it was insane. I thought, as I walked back and looked at Steph apologetically. 
The ER was at a standstill. No one could tell me for sure when we would even be seen. It was pissing me off. My little girl was in excruciating pain, and these assholes didn't seem to care. I marched up to the glass, banging to get their attention. John, this isn't going to help, Steph told me angrily, but I wasn't listening. We had been waiting for hours and still hadn't even gotten to a bed. We should have been sent straight up to labor and delivery. What, what's the holdup? I demanded. Sir, you need to take a seat. I understand your concerns, but right now, labor and delivery can't accommodate anyone. There's nothing we can do, the nurse said, but but it was in a harsh tone. Something about the tone set me off, and I started to raise my voice. Don't be condescending with me. Our baby is in pain, and you're just telling me to, to shrug it off? She got on her radio and muffled something, which only made me more upset. Hold on, did you just call security on me? Because I'm mad that you haven't lifted a finger to help my baby? A moment later, an officer twice my size entered the room. Steph grabbed my shoulder, giving me a look. Maybe we should just go, she said. I looked over to Rita, who was continuing to squeal and looked like she couldn't even breathe properly. My heart breaking as I realized the hospital was close to throwing us out. If you don't take a seat and cooperate, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to leave, the guard warned. But I had had enough. I grabbed our stuff and I marched out. Part of me felt foolish. We were no closer to figuring out why Rita was upset, but I was tired of feeling that my time was wasted. On the drive home, Steph gave me the stink eye, but agreed that we had chosen to go at the wrong time. There's an urgent care pediatrics, but it won't be open until the morning, she said, checking her phone. It was better than nothing, as much as I hated the prospect of letting our baby scream all night. I wasn't sure what choice we had. When we got home, we took shifts taking care of her, trying to make sure she ate or had a diaper change. Rita never stopped wailing. I was sure she was in excruciating distress, and we were doing nothing to make it better. Our own stress was through the roof. I, I told my wife to get a bit of sleep, if she could, and I took Rita to the guest room. The walls were thicker in there, so I guess if one of us brought her in here to cry, the other could get some much-needed shut-eye. Steph admitted sleep was going to be difficult. Even without hearing her infant, her motherly instincts took over, and she was checking up on us almost every half hour. I'm handling her so you can get some sleep, I told her, as I tried again to rock Rita. Her face was bright red by now, and I couldn't even imagine how she had managed to scream all day. My mind told me that this had to be impossible. I mean, if she, if she was that deprived of oxygen, she would have passed out. There would have been moments where she caught her breath, but I simply wasn't noticing it. It couldn't possibly be this bad. I didn't want to imagine it permanently harming her, but with each passing moment at home, that dreaded thought lingered in my mind, especially as I looked at her and saw her veins popping near her neck and forehead. I mean, what if this caused permanent brain damage or worse? Deep breath, I thought frantically, and yet here I was sitting in the dark, unable to do a single thing to help her. As I rocked her, her piercing squeals heightened my anxiety with each passing second. My fear was compounded by searching for similar cases online. Many of the things people claimed happened to their newborn were terrifying. Nightmare-inducing images of babies with bleeding mouths and ears filled my screen. It was enough to make my stomach turn end over end. I mean, this couldn't possibly be happening to my Rita. When Steph took over to let me rest, my head was filled with frightening thoughts of what could be happening. Yet somehow, we made it through the night. I think sheer exhaustion finally took us past our breaking point. In the morning, Rita was still in pain, her throat dry from her screams, her little body wailing. Steph was trying her best to keep it together as we hurried and got in the car again. We were holding out hope that the pediatric urgent care would have the answers we needed. But it wound up a dead end. They did a cursory check of Rita, including her lungs and, and checking her for infections, but after running tests, they surprised us and said there was nothing noticeably wrong with her. No fever, no broken bones, no signs of trauma. If you ask me, this is just a short phase that your baby's going through. She took fluids like normal, so there's really no need to worry. You'll simply have to endure it. My wife looked like she was about to snap. They simply didn't believe us, she said, when we left. No baby could scream that long or be unable to sleep. So, because our story was so unfathomable, they sent us on our merry way, thinking we were just a pair of typical, overly concerned parents. I was at a loss. 
We had gone to the doctors and finally gotten tests done, but nothing, nothing explained what was happening to her. Think of this as waiting for a butterfly to emerge from a cocoon. The transformation itself can be a little ugly, the nurse said as we walked out of the urgent care office. I didn't even bother saying thank you. I mean, in my mind, they had done absolutely nothing to help us. I don't think I can handle much more of this, Steph lamented, as we got home and tried to settle Rita again with every trick in the book. Her screams only seemed to get worse. She kept clawing and scratching, hitting and wailing. It was clear she was desperate for our help. I knew that I wasn't as competent as a doctor, so I wasn't about to, to challenge their diagnosis, but instead I did the only thing I could think of, and I... I told my job I'd try to come in the next day. I mean, I, I had to get my mind off this. Steph wasn't too happy when I gave her that news. You're just going to leave me here alone so you can get away from her? She snapped. I wasn't in the mood to argue. Rita was driving us up the wall with her painful cries, and we were turning on each other. I apologized, and I left not long after that, promising I would check in to see if Rita had finally settled. We have to trust the doctors know what they're talking about. I mean, if something's wrong, they would know, I told her. He didn't even do an internal scan. I mean, what if something's inside her and hurting her? Steph said desperately. They did all the tests they felt were necessary, I told her. I had my doubts too. I mean, something was wrong with our daughter. That much was clear. The only thing I could think of was the recent checkup. So when I went to work and... At a bit of free time, I called the clinic to find out precisely what they had given to Rita that day. Oh, little Rita May, how is she? The nurse asked cheerfully over the phone. I didn't bother trying to convince them of any issues and repeated my inquiry. Just typical shots we give to every newborn at that stage. I, I must say I meant to call and ask how your wife was handling it. She couldn't even bear to watch when we administered the needle. I picked up on the choice words and asked the nurse to explain. Oh, what I mean to say is that she stepped out of the room when we gave the vaccine. I mean, it's actually pretty common, I guess. No one wants to see their baby in that sort of pain. I thanked the nurse, trying not to panic as my mind wondered why this felt significant. Stephanie had left the room. I mean, what if they'd done something to Rita that wasn't on record? Another dark thought crossed my mind as I drove home. What if one of the nurses had discreetly swapped out Rita with another newborn in the clinic? I mean, it was the type of scenario that no parent wanted to ever fathom, but it, it could fit all the behavioral issues we've seen. I and mean, had, had we foolishly been doting on a baby we didn't know? An infant that was screaming frantically to be returned to their own family? Was our Rita out there somewhere right now trying desperately to let whoever had taken her know about this terrible mistake? As I pulled into the driveway, I couldn't help but to take a long breath. I was letting my imagination run wild. There was no reason to suspect something so nightmarish had happened. I just need to be here and support my wife, and we'll get through this, I told myself as I walked inside the house. To my surprise, as I unlocked the door, I soon was greeted with silence. The small duplex we rented was dark, and I sighed in relief. Surely this was a good sign. Rita had finally settled down. I dropped my keys and I walked to the nursery, flipping on the lights, eager to see our sleeping little princess. Instead, instead I was greeted with the manifestation of all my fears combined. A blood-soaked mattress. I stood there staring at it in disbelief and then towards the floor where I saw what looked like a tiny trail of mucus and blood zigzagging towards the door. The small crib she'd been lying in was all torn apart as if by sheer force. I turned and called out to my wife, but there was no response. My heart pounded as I followed the trail of blood and guts into our bedroom. The soft gleam of my phone light revealing more gory viscera on display in our king-sized bed. My heart sank as I turned on the light and saw... Stephanie, lying there in her own blood, her legs open and covered in scratches and teeth marks as I saw what had happened. Our newborn, 
or rather whatever had replaced her, had forcibly pushed its way inside of my wife's body again. The sheer amount of tissue and blood that covered the bed told me that Steph had done her best to fight off this monster, but the results... The results had been a losing battle. Now she was decomposing, staring wide-eyed and soulless up at the sky as the creature wriggled under her belly. Torn in every direction, I saw the creature pulsing with a heartbeat inside of my dead wife's womb. I screamed and backed away from the horrific scene, calling 911 as I bailed out of the door and struggled to catch my breath. I was hardly making sense to the operator, but I gave them my address and they said that they'd be there in 30 minutes. Somewhere in the span of time, the miniature demon that had crawled its way into our lives and fooled us into believing it was my sweet Rita Mae had vanished into the night. When the techs got there, all they found was what little was left of my wife. It's like something shoved its way inside her body, ate her from the inside out, one of the technicians said in disbelief. He was a small comfort, but they told me there were signs of a struggle. Steph... Steph had tried to fight back. The creature must have been waiting until we were so exhausted that we couldn't put up a fight. I realized sourly as I, I thanked them for coming. They told me the police want to question me. Typical procedure. One thing swirls around in my mind as I try to make sense of what little sanity I have left. Where's my daughter? What happened to her? I fear I may never know, and I'd be labeled a monster myself. Who would believe this shocking story? In the distant air amidst the shadows, I hear a newborn baby wail. Is that my Rita? Or is the creature beckoning me to my own demise? I've sat here on the porch for an hour waiting for the police and I heard the infant in the woods calling out to me. I, I don't know what I'll find out there, but feel compelled to find it. Did you know that I stream? I stream sometimes. I stream games. I stream games on twitch.tv slash mrcreepypasta. If you guys have not been at twitch.tv slash mrcreepypasta before, please do so. You get more of me. Sometimes you get behind the scenes when it comes down to me recording stories for this channel. And also, you can bully me into recording more stories for this channel, which I think all of you enjoy doing. So please do so. Watch me play video games with my friends, or watch me play video games alone, or bully me. That's a common thing that happens on Twitch. I'm trying to make Twitch happen a lot more, so please stop by more often. I stream very, very frequently. And finally, as always, I want to thank everybody who is on my Patreon list. Especially, I want to give a huge thank you to... Triller Tier Jackal, Ryan Figueroa, Ethan Leon, Polaris Prospect X, Lake Rattler, Vice Royce Ford, Disciple, Delaney Melton, Strategy, Wolf, Jameson, John G. Luna, Sully Man, Juan Mendoza, Rock Bottom Smasher, Elias Nahero, Brandon Mendoza, Snack, Brimstone Pendulum, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Victoria Schwartz, Victoria Miles, Aaron, Emma, Kemza, Brenda Crow, Elijah Munson, Lakeda Carrizales, Mr. Keepy Pasta Peebus Pleaser, Travis, Smiley Psychotic, Richard Sundell, Buddha B, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, M, Jettis Pet, Verbal Horror, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Gordon Dallas, Estabeen, Our Minute Second Time, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Mr. Marcus Splits, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tully Sue, Cronut509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Tommy Wall, Tommy Walters, Asset System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, Corey X. Kenshin, Diana Krause, Jordan Humble, a man of many names. And every single one of you that's down there in the description, every single one of you that is able to give even one dollar, man, it, I cannot thank you all enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you. To all of you out there, have a wonderful evening and sweet dreams. <laughs>